This sermon is titled Waiting for God's Timing. Be enriched as you listen. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord it's this morning. It's such an honor and a privilege to be ministering God's word here this morning. I want to thank God for the opportunity. Thank you so much pastor for giving me this opportunity as well. All right, so this morning we are looking at a simple yet very important topic. And I've entitled today's sermon, Waiting for God's Timing. Waiting for God's Timing. Now of all the principles that we learn from the scriptures, one of the concepts that really stands out is the principle of waiting. The Bible mentions the word waiting about 116 times. And God's will includes God's timing. Now God has a plan mapped out for each one of us. He has a blueprint. And he's got this plan, but most often, God reveals this plan one step at a time. Right? When we follow God, we are fulfilled and God is glorified. God has a bird's eye view of his timing for each of our lives. But here's the problem. Delays can be agonizing. And especially in a time and a season and a generation that we are living in, where everything is available on our fingertips, instantly available, we don't like to wait. Whether it's waiting in the airport, waiting for a cab, waiting in the supermarket, we don't like to wait. But thankfully, the Word of God teaches us that when we wait for God's timing, there are many benefits that we will learn in our lives. Look at the example of a, of a seed a simple small seed sown in fertile ground it will eventually become a strong tree. But from the time that seed is planted to the time of harvesting, there are seasons of waiting. It doesn't just happen overnight. The seed must push through the darkness, break through the soil and reach for the sunlight. The same way you and I as believers when God expects us to wait. Our roots of faith begin to grow. We reach out to God and we expect God's guidance for our lives. So this morning, we're going to glean lessons from the Bible on waiting. And the Bible admonishes us to wait. Just a few scriptures here. Psalms 27 verse 14. Wait for the Lord, be strong. And let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. Psalms 33 was 20 through 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Psalms 130 and verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in His word I put my hope. Psalms 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord and He inclined to me and heard my cry. Isaiah 64 and verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. And finally, Isaiah 40 and verse 31, a very common passage that we all declare. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now when we look at the scriptures and when we talk about waiting, there are two aspects that we must understand when it comes to waiting. There is the aspect of waiting on the Lord and the aspect of waiting for God's timing. And there is a difference in these two. Waiting on the Lord is a posture of spending time in fellowship in God's word, in worship, in prayer, and listening to the Holy Spirit. And then there's the aspect of waiting for God's timing. Waiting for God's timing is a confident expectation of God's plans, His purposes, His promises to be fulfilled in our lives. And I'm sure each one of us may have gone through seasons of waiting. Or maybe some of us are already in a season of waiting. Now this waiting for God's timing involves submitting to God's will and God's timing. It's yielding to it. It also 
is relying on the wisdom and the knowledge of God and expecting God's guidance and intervention even as we wait for the Lord. Amen? Everyone with me? Right, so this morning we're going to focus on waiting for God's timing. And we're going to learn and from four individuals from the scriptures, two from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament, and glean lessons from their life and how they waited and how God so beautifully and marvelously just orchestrated things in their lives and they fulfilled the call of God on their lives. Right, so uh, most of it we may be a little familiar with, but it's good to just go through it uh, so that we can refresh ourselves. Firstly, let's look at the life of Abraham. Abraham is known as the father of faith. God handpicks Abraham and says, Abraham, I have a call for you. I have a plan and a purpose that you are going to fulfill. I will make your name great and you will be a great nation. But there's only one problem, God. I don't have a son. But God makes a covenant with him. And says, I will make you a great nation. That's going to happen. But Abraham went through seasons of waiting. And even during that waiting, he made mistakes. He made many failures. There were, there were times when he doubted. But God was with him. And about 10 years later in Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, Abraham, come out of your tent. Look up into the night skies and count the number of stars in the sky. That many will be your descendants. God cut a covenant there with him. A blood covenant. God again changed Abraham's name. He changed his identity. He changed who he is. There was no son yet, but his name was changed. His identity was changed. Eventually, when Abraham was a hundred years old, he got the promise of Isaac. The promise was fulfilled. So Abraham and Sarah waited for 25 years for the promise to be fulfilled in their lives. Now let's look at a few key insights that we can learn from Abraham's waiting. Three points. Number one, trust in God's timing. Trusting in his timing. You know, it's, it's wonderful when we, when we want something and we, you know, we get it immediately or just a little bit of waiting. It's wonderful. But especially when the delay is long, we got to trust in God's timing. Two, faith in action. Even as we are in seasons of waiting, we put our faith into action. Abraham, what did he do? God said, I want, to pack, I want you to pack your bags and go to another place. He did it. He stepped out in faith and he put his faith into action. Even as he waited. And then thirdly, embracing uncertainties. Now, especially in seasons of waiting, it's uncertain what is going to happen next. We don't know what door is, is, we don't know what doors are there. But we embrace those uncertainties. Abraham's life illustrates to us that waiting can lead us to a deeper trust and a deeper, richer understanding of who God is and of his promises. Each moment of waiting can shape us and prepare us into the fulfillment of what God wants to do in each of our lives. Secondly, let's look at the life of David. David was known as the man after God's own heart. Probably when he was about 17 years old, he was anointed the king of Israel. Right? He had his initial success, you know, when he defeated the giant. When he single-handedly defeated Goliath and led the Israelites to victory against the Philistines. But the tides turned on David. The next thing you know, David is running for his life. He's living in caves, living as a vagabond for the next five to six years. Now think of this. The anointed man of God who is going to be the next king of Israel is hiding in caves. Oh, if I was David, I'd say, God, are you serious? I don't want to be here. I don't like this place. You just anointed me the king of Israel, and I'm running away for from, from my life. But look at these two scenarios. What if David went up to King Saul and said, all right, king, you saw what I did to Goliath. So if you don't mind, just step off from your throne, and I will take over from here. It didn't happen that way. 
or not at King Saul's, this would have been wonderful. What if King Saul had said, All right, David, I've seen what you did and how you single-handedly led the Israelites to victory. And I know that prophet Samuel has anointed you as the next king. So here's what you do. Four days a week, you come into this palace or this temple and we will train you. I have leaders assigned who will train you. You will be trained in leadership, trained in military warfare. You'll be trained in how to manage this, to be a king, how to be a king. And then on Saturdays, we have our weekend school of prophetic ministry. So you can join the weekend school of prophetic ministry. So you write some prophetic songs. But it didn't happen that way. Imagine King Saul had done it and then he would have said, okay, once I pass on, David, you come and sit in the throne. It would have been beautiful. But it didn't happen that way. But while David was running, God sent 400 men to be with David. Have you ever thought of this? Why did God, why, why 400 men for David? What was he? He had nothing with him. He had nothing with him, but God sent 400 men. And these 400 men later became mighty captains in, uh, in the army of Israel. Finally, when David was 23 years old, he became the king of Judah. And then when he was 30 years old, he became the king of Israel and Judah. About 14 years of waiting from the time he was commissioned by prophet Samuel to the time he stepped into his call for his life. 14 years. What are some of the key insights that we can learn from David's waiting? Firstly, there is an anointing and there is a reality. Yes, God has anointed us, but David had to face a real world. Even though he was anointed, even though he killed Goliath, the next thing, Saul was jealous and was after his life. And so there's a reality. There are battles that you and I will have to face. There are mountains that you and I will have to climb. That's the reality of life. But here's the thing. God has promised to be with us. Amen? Amen? Everyone with me? Yes? All right. Secondly, even when we are fighting those battles, God gives us the courage in adversity. Right? In, in those battles that we are fighting, God gives us courage. He gives us the strength to fight those battles. Thirdly, development of character to a point where God himself said, David is a man after my own heart. Waiting can refine our character. Waiting fortifies our resolve. And waiting can cultivate unwavering trust in the sovereign plan of God. That's what waiting does for us. And so no matter what season we are in, if we are waiting, you know, we can be assured that even in our seasons of waiting, God is working behind the scenes like a grand weaver weaving things in each of our lives. Now let's look at two examples from the New Testament. Firstly, let's look at the great Apostle Paul, a champion ambassador for Christ. Apostle Paul had great revelations of, of God, right? Planted many churches across Europe, Asia Minor, uh, wrote two thirds of the New Testament. But even this great Apostle Paul went through seasons of waiting. Let's look at his life. Paul must have been about 33 years old when he, uh, you know, when he became, when he had this encounter with the Lord Jesus. He's on the road to Damascus and he has one goal in mind. I'm going to wipe out this religion called Christianity. And we know the story. The Lord Jesus appears to him and the Lord Jesus himself gives Paul his call and purpose for his life. He says, Paul, listen, you are going to be a light to the Gentiles and an apostle of faith. That's beautiful to get a call directly from the Lord. You're going to be a light to the Gentiles and an apostle of faith. The next thing we see is Paul goes into Damascus. They try to kill him there. Then he flees to Arabia. He spends about three years in Arabia. He, most of his revelations, he may have received it during this time in Arabia. And towards the end of those three years, he came back. He came to Jerusalem, his second visit in Jerusalem. He stayed there for about 15 days. They try to kill him and he escapes Jerusalem, goes back to his hometown in Tarsus and he stays there for the next 
13 years. Everyone say 13 years. That's a long time for a man who has been commissioned by the Lord himself. Next 13 years, he's in Tarsus, Sicilia, Syria, around that region. And there's no account of what he did during those times. Towards the end of those 13 years, the church in Jerusalem is growing. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch to look after the church there. And so Barnabas says, hey, I remember this man named Saul of Tarsus. Bring Saul of Tarsus to Antioch. And they minister there for one year. And after that year, he goes to Jerusalem. Acts 13, Paul launches out on his first missionary journey. Now, from the road to Damascus to the time he launches out on his first missionary journey, it's now been 17 years of waiting. 17 years of waiting. What does this teach us? God is not in a hurry. Amen. God is never in a hurry. He knows when to do what and how to do it. 17 years of waiting and 17 years of preparation. What are some of the key insights that we learn from Paul's waiting? There is a call, there's a preparation. We heard this saying, greater the call, greater is the waiting and the preparation. Two, even as we wait, we see that Paul seeked God's guidance. And three, he persevered in trials. Now, Paul's life illustrates that waiting on the Lord is not just a passive experience, but is an active expression of our faith. We're doing something about it. Waiting doesn't mean just sitting and doing nothing. It is a passive, it's, it's an active work that we are doing. So, shall we just declare this over our lives? If you don't mind, just, you know, place your hands over your heart. Say this after me. Waiting time is never wasted time. Even as I wait, I know that God is shaping me. He's preparing me for the call that he has for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lastly, let's look at the life of Jesus himself. You know, God the Father, in Genesis 3.15, it says that, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we go all the way to Galatians 4 and 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now God waited 4,000 years to do one of the most important work that he was going to do. That is to send his son, Jesus Christ, into this world. He knew when to do it and he waited 4,000 years. Now don't be worried, he's not going to ask you to wait 4,000 years. But let's look at the life of Jesus. When Jesus came into this world, God made him wait. The Father, you know, Jesus was so in tune with the Father's timing that even when Jesus, you know, there's a small account of him when he was 12 years old in the synagogue teaching. But the next account is when he's 30 years old and he begins his ministry there. Now, it would have been nice if Jesus had started his ministry when he was young, 20 years old. You know, 20 is the prime age. Right? You're 20 years old. You're all strong and you, know, you can do so much. But no, Jesus exercised patience. And he waited for God's timing. It was not until when the father said, you know, you can just picture that. You know, he's in the wedding at Cana. And the wine has run out. And Jesus, his mother comes to him and says, we've run out of wine. And Jesus' response was, what, what am I supposed to do with it? And the next verse, Jesus says, go fill the water pots. I believe that that moment, the father would have said, now is the time. Go for it. And he said, you fill the water pots. And he turned it into wine. Jesus' life reveals a profound lesson on waiting. He practiced patience even though he was the son of God. He exemplified surrender through prayer and surrendering to God's will for his life. Now, just a little disclaimer here before I go ahead. We must understand that not all delays are orchestrated by God. 
There are a few delays that happens because we are not doing what we must be doing or we are doing things that we must not be doing. And a classic example would be that of Moses. Moses knew that he is going to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, but he took matters into his own hands. He killed the Egyptian, and the next thing you know, he's running for his life. 40 years, he delayed the process. So what must you and I do? Uh, just a few points here. We must accept responsibility to do our part. Even as we are waiting, there's, there's God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And they both go hand in hand. Perfect example would be of Elijah. God tells Elijah, it's going to rain. Elijah went back to his, went back to the mountain. He put his face in between his knees and he began to pray for that rain. There's God's sovereignty, human responsibility. We must move. We will have to move in great faith, especially in times of se seasons of waiting when we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's the next step. And the enemy gets ready with his fiery darts and he's ready to just release those fiery darts. You and I need to move in great faith. We put on the shield of faith and we quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Thirdly, we must be very flexible. There will be times when in our seasons of waiting, God will take us out of our comfort zone. He may make us do things that we are not really comfortable doing. Then we must hold fast to the past prophecies or past promises that have been made over our lives. Even as we are waiting, we live in complete obedience to God. Obedience to His word. During our waiting seasons, we need to realize that there will be battles that we will have to fight. And it's important that you and I choose the battles that we fight. So we don't go around searching for battles to fight. There will be battles that will come our way. We can't stop them from happening. But when those battles come, Ephesians 6, we put on the armor of God and be ready to face those battles. We must recognize our need for help. And even as we are waiting, we let the peace of God sustain us. It's very easy to get weary and troubled in our spirit. We can pray and say, Lord, may your peace that passeth all understanding rule and reign in my heart, even as I wait. It could be in the mind, in our spirit, we can pray this and say, let the peace of God rule and reign in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit. So, if some of us, you know, are going through seasons of waiting, sometimes, you know, God just keeps the wheels in motion. We don't have to wait. So that's wonderful. That's beautiful when that happens. Right? But, they, but if we are waiting, why does God require us to wait? We may ask that question. Why can't you just, Lord, why can't you give it to me in one month? Or maximum one year. Why do I have to wait? And I definitely don't want to wait 25 years like Abraham or like, you know, the others who waited. But why, do, why does God make us wait? Just put down a few points here, five points. Now, this is not uh, an exhaustive list. There are many other points, but I've just put down five here. Number one, to receive his clear direction. Psalms 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, when we don't know the future, we may become impatient. But the word of God clearly teaches us that his word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. So we can pray and say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what step to take. And when we, when we pray and we read his word, he gives us clear direction. It may be just one step. But that's a clear direction. We, he has given us his word and his spirit to lead us and guide us. Secondly, to keep in step with his timing. Psalms 32 and verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The Lord is saying here, I will teach you and instruct you where you should go. Now picture this. It's like a father taking a little son, a little child and instructing him. Okay, do this. Don't do this. Even when we have prayed according to God's will, 
It's not necessary. We can't presume that it's going to happen immediately. We must understand that God has his timing in place. And so you and I as believers must develop the ability to learn to read time on God's clock. A supernatural clock. Thirdly, to test our faith. Now, when the Lord tests our faith, it is not to judge us or not to point fingers at us to show our weaknesses and our failures. James 1, 2 and 3 says, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So the reason the Lord tests our faith is because it produces patience. We'll be able to wait in the airport easily. You know, we know that God has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1 talks about it. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. But God sometimes makes us wait because we are not yet ready to receive those promises. Then, to strengthen our faith. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Waiting teaches us to walk by faith, trusting in God's timing, instead of giving in to immediate self-gratification. Now, what does this mean? You know, in seasons of waiting, we are very vulnerable because the enemy can use even the smallest opportunity to make us fall. Even if the tea is cold, we can get upset. Right? But, you know, the Lord teaches us to strengthen our faith and not to give in to immediate gratification. At that moment, we may feel good, but it's only going to take us away. We're going to grieve the Holy Spirit and, you know, just um, cause delays in our life. Lastly, to sift the motives of our desires Psalms 37 and verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. God's delay in answering prayers sometimes enables us to see things in God's view rather than our view. In, my, in our thinking or in our understanding, we feel, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this, and then you know, everything will work out well for my life. That's wonderful if it happens, but when it doesn't happen, Waiting enables us to shift our desires. I mean, look at what God looks at the situation. How does God see the situation? And so we look at things from God's viewpoint and not from our own, uh, in our own desires or in our own ways. Right, so let's get into how we should wait. Now, many of us may be in a season of waiting right now. Maybe we're waiting for a door or an opportunity, saying, God, it's been months, it's been years, and I've been waiting. I don't see anything, I don't see any result. God, I'm tired, I'm weary, and I'm almost on the verge of giving up. But I want to encourage you this morning. We can wait for the Lord. So how do we wait? I just put down six points here. Number one, we wait patiently. Psalms 40, verse 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and trust the Lord. When we wait patiently for God, we understand that God is wiser than we are. His ways are better than our ways. And we know that blessings will follow obedience. Two, we wait quietly. Psalms 62 and verse 5. My soul, wait in silence for God alone, for my hope is from Him. Now, even as we are waiting, it's very, easily, it's very easy for us to come into this place of grumbling and complaining. How do we know this? Look at the example in, where in, in the Old Testament when God was bringing the people out of Israel into the promised land. 
God with his mighty hand did so many wonderful miracles. None of those plagues touched the Israelites. He brought them all out of Egypt. They, he parted the seas into two. They walked on dry land. And the moment they crossed, what did they do? They said, let's kill Moses. Why, why Moses, why did you bring us out of, this, out of Egypt? There's no water. There's no food. And the food that's falling from heaven is weird and it's taste, tasteless. Why did you bring us out? They began to grumble and complain. They didn't see the bigger picture. And because of this complaining, a journey which normally takes about 50 to maybe about 50 days, took 40 years for them to reach that promised land. What were they doing? There was a mountain called Mount Sire and they were going round and round that mountain. They thought they were gaining ground but they were just circling about there. And it was only at a certain time when God said, all right, pack your bags. I'm going to take you into the promised land. So grumbling and complaining can delay the promises of God in our lives. So we can say, God, help me. You know, it's a natural thing to grumble or to complain. Sometimes it comes out naturally. But we can say, God, help me. Help me to rest my soul. Even when I see all the storms around me, all that is happening around me, help me to rest my soul, rest my mind, rest my spirit, knowing that you are with me. Then we look at next point, trusting. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Now, we talked about this. Waiting isn't just a passive resignation, but it is a, an active work that you and I are doing, right? So even as we wait, we're waiting, trusting that God is a loving God and He will answer our prayers, but not always according to our ways or our timing. Since this morning, today is Mission Sunday, I'd like to share a simple story, but one of the most heart-moving stories that I've ever read. In church history a story of trust a story of hope a story of patience a story of endurance this is about a li the life of a man named David Livingston David Livingston was born in Blantyre Scotland 1813 as a young boy his father would read stories to him of great missionaries who did great exploits for God's kingdom and one particular example is that of Carl Gutzlaff. He was a Dutch missionary who later doubled up as a medical missionary. Now David Livingston looked at his father and said, I want to be a missionary, I want to be a doctor, and I want to serve God. So at a young age, he packed his bags and he went into Africa. He saw those villages and one of some of the prayers he prayed was so profound. He prayed, Lord, take me where you want to, wherever you want, but only go with me. Lay any burden on me, but only sustain me. He began to do ministry in Africa, going into villages, tribes, in the jungles. In some of his jungle uh, journeys, uh, a, a, a branch of a tree went into his eyes, severed his eyes, and he was blinded in one eye. He was attacked by a lion that almost tore his shoulder apart, but he miraculously survived. And a few years later, five years it, Later, he goes back to his hometown. His wife could barely recognize him because his body was so marred and scarred by all the things that he did in ministry. But a couple of years later, he said, I've got to go back to Africa. God has a call for my life and I trust God will continue to be with me. So he told his wife, I'll go to Africa. And she promised to join him a few months later. And when his wife joined, her, joined him, the day she set foot on Africa, in, into Africa, she contracted a disease and a few months later she died and he was burying her. They heard, her, heard him pray and say, God, you promised that you will sustain me no matter how big that burden is. So he got up, he went to his little home in the village of Ujiji. When he went there, to his surprise, somebody had stolen all his medications, stolen all his paperwork, all that he'd been writing. He got down on his knees and he began to pray and he said, God, you promised that you'll be with me. I cannot do without these medicines. If I have to do ministry, I need those medicines. The moment he finished that prayer, he saw a white man come towards him. 
It was a press reporter. His name was Henry. And he said, my name is Henry. And I've, come, I've been confined to write a story about your life. But I want, you to know, I want you to know two things, David. One is, I'm the biggest atheist on the face of the earth. And two, somebody has sent medicines. David Livingston took those medicines. Now for four months, Henry moved about and traveled along with David Livingston. After four months, Henry M. Stanley, the biggest atheist in the world, knelt down on African soil and gave his life to Christ. One of the best biographies that you will read, two volumes, Livingston of Africa. Finally, his body couldn't take it anymore. They were carrying him in a stretcher and he would, you know, he would preach from the stretcher. And the time came, he said, I can't do this. They carried him. They were going to spill him over on the bed. He said, no, put me on my knees. They put him on his knees and he began to pray. A few hours later, David Livingston died in the presence of God. What, are, what am I trying to say? You know, when we trust the Lord, he will fulfill every plan, every purpose that he has. There will be battles. There will be seasons that we will go through. But we can hold fast to his promises. Next. We wait expectantly, Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a, ho and a hope. The Holy Spirit, even as we become believers, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in, in each of us. And even as he's residing in each of us, the Bible says he will reveal his plans for us. So we, you and I can be expected. So every time we wake up in the morning and we go to that quiet place to read God's word, to pray, we can expect God to pray, to speak to us. It is not a ritual. It's not something we're doing because we are Christians. We're doing it because we pray, we seek the Lord, because we know that God speaks to us and we can expect His intervention and His guidance for our life. Then we wait courageously. I'd like to invite the worship team to please come up. Thank you. We wait courageously. Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Waiting on God requires courage. It requires courage. It requires strength. Right? Um, Look at uh, the next point, standing. We wait standing on God's word. Matthew 24 and 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but by word, by no means, pass away. Scripture, the word of God, is the foundation on which you and I stand on. Now, God's word is so powerful that when you and I stand on God's word, there is no weapon fashioned against us that can prosper. Right? God's word is something that we can hold on to. We can stand on God's word. Say, God, you promised in your word that you will do this for my life. So, Lord, I'm waiting expectantly. I'm going to do everything that you have commanded me to do. And I know that if this is what you have said, you will do it in my life. Look at the example of Joshua. Joshua has a mountain of a task ahead of him. He has to take these people of Israel into the promised land. But there's a problem. Joshua chapter 6. There's a huge wall of Jericho that's standing there. And probably Joshua is thinking to myself, all right. He's thinking to himself, let's, let's just go and destroy that wall. But God gives instructions to Joshua. Very clear instructions. Here's what you do. You walk around that wall quietly around that wall for seven days. On the seventh day, on the seventh time, you raise up your voices, praise God, begin to play the flute and the instruments, and then you will see the walls crumbling down. Now think of this. Imagine those Israelites walking around that wall. Fifth time, there's no crack on the wall. There's no sign of the wall coming down. It's the sixth time, the wall is still as strong as possible. There's not even a crack and the people of Israel are saying, are you sure this is going to work out? Does God have a plan B? And I can just picture 
Joshua is saying, no plan B, stick to plan A. So the seventh time, even as they go, they held on to God's word and they began to sing praises and those walls came crumbling down. There was no sign the first six times, but they held on to that word. God has said it, he will do it. And you and I have this word of God. The entire Bible, we can declare the promises and say, God, you have said it and I know you will do it and I trust in you. Finally, I just want to leave us with this promise verse. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. Amen. Right, even as we are maybe in seasons of waiting, let us develop these abilities and trust God in our seasons of waiting. Shall we just rise up in the presence of God? Oh, let's just take a few moments. You know, maybe some of us here are, have just been waiting, whether it's, a, it's for a healing, whether it's God to open a door in the workplace, an opportunity that God wants, that you've been waiting for, and it's been many years. No matter what sphere of influence that God has placed you in, and you're saying, God, I don't know why this door hasn't opened. Or maybe you're saying, God, am I doing something wrong? Is there something that I must be doing? Trust in the Lord. So let's embrace this gift of waiting even as the worship team ministers to us I want to encourage you just take a few moments just between you and the Lord now just pour out your heart to him we don't need to hide anything in our heart just pour it out and say God this is the problem that I am going through even as I'm waiting Lord help me speak to me minister to me I want to be obedient to your leading. I want to be obedient to your promises, to your word. Help me to walk in faith. Let's take a few moments even as the worship team ministers to us. You heard your children and you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God move in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You
Father, we just stand on your faithfulness this morning, O oh Lord. Though maybe some of us here have been waiting and waiting and waiting and just become weary and weak. Father, I just pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you will strengthen us, O oh God, that we will stand on your promises, that even if we are in a season of waiting, Lord, that you will give us the strength, the courage, the boldness, the faith, that we will walk patiently, quietly, trusting in your word, trusting in your promises of God. And we thank you that you are a God who loves us. We thank you for your word is true, that your word is eternal. And when you have promised to do something in our lives, Lord, you will fulfill it in our lives of God. And Lord, even as we wait for you, we wait for you to open doors in our lives, whether it is healing over our bodies, whether it is an open door in the workplace, whether it is in our family, no matter what place we are in, no matter what, play, what season of waiting we are in, Lord, no matter what sphere of influence, I pray, God, that you will minister to us. Lord, that these waiting seasons will be a seasons of hope, seasons of encouragement, seasons of patience and learning and growing in the Lord. And Lord, we pray that you will teach us, Lord, to spend time in your presence, spend time reading your word, spend time in fellowship. That is where we gain our strength, O oh Lord. And, there, and Lord, we thank you for Ephesians 6 says, to put on the armor of God. And even as we put on that armor, Lord, we believe that you are going with us and you will make every crooked path straight. Every fear, we come against every spirit of fear, doubt, that is crowding our minds and our hearts. We speak the word of God. We speak the light of God to break through that darkness, to break through that fear. Maybe there's some of us who are praying and waiting for healing. It's been many years. You feel like giving up. I want to encourage you. Hold on. Hold on to his promises. Hold on because he is a covenant keeping God. What He has promised, He will fulfill it in our lives. Holy Spirit, I ask that You move in our midst. Move in our midst, Lord. Minister to our hearts, even at this moment, right now. Give us a word. Stir us up in our hearts, in our spirit. And even as we leave from here, oh God, we go back with a new hope, with a new fervor, with a new understanding of who you are and what you can do in each of our lives. So Lord, speak, Lord. Speak to us. Lord, we need you. We need you so much, O oh God. Without you, we can do nothing, O oh God. Thank you for your word. Zechariah 4, 6, that says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit and so we completely rely on the leading and the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives again. We thank you for greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And even as we go from here, oh God, we go back, we look at the week ahead, oh God. Work, commitments, things to get done and everything that we have to do, Lord, we just surrender it at your feet. And I pray, God, that you will be glorified. You will be glorified in each of our lives. And you will teach us, you will melt us, mold us, shape us into what you want us to be, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Renew us. Thank you, Father. Even as we go from here, Lord, may your spirit Continue to lead us and guide us, God, every step of the way. Thank you, Father. Even before uh, I pronounce the benediction, today is the missions workshop, and those who have registered or those who would like to be part of the missions workshop, we're meeting at the AV Hall towards my right on the first floor, and Shika and team should be there to help you out uh, for the missions workshop. Right, let's just close with a benediction.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes and books, please visit apcw.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.